pleased to have you again, Greg. Um, I should note to everybody else, Greg has already started sharing uh, a lot of his expertise in a previous webinar that's available on our, our website. And just has continued to really uh, make leaps and bounds in, in, in the space of rapid imagery processing, rapid drone deployment. So, Greg, I know you're very busy. I think you were just in Europe at another workshop. Uh, thank you so much for making the time. It's really great to have you back. Yeah, no, it's, it's great to be here. Um, let me just kind of run briefly over some of my background um, in the industry, and, and um, then we'll talk about some of the lessons learned and kind of where I see uh, some, of, some of my work going next. Um, so just a quick, this, uh, this used to be me. Um, so I'm trained as a, as a professional ecologist. Uh, so I was a professor for a while. I worked in Kenya. I worked in Sweden. I kind of worked all over. Um, and got excited about drones, uh, mostly for plant mapping and for mapping with experiments and drones as kind of flying robots uh, for doing the same thing over and over and over again, um, which is, as a researcher, really appealing um, since research is a fairly tedious task. I got so excited about drones, I actually left uh, a tenure-track academic job, a pretty good one, uh, and joined the drone world. So here's my new world. Um, so I've worked for some of the, uh, the major hardware uh, companies uh, in, in drones, and then I, I moved on to software and really uh, the analytics side of drones. Um, so I'm coming as like a professional ecologist into the startup world um, and, and then really got excited about the data side. And so I founded a company called Scholar Farms, um, and basically what I do now is, is a lot of online training specifically around vegetation mapping, since that's really my expertise. Um, so I have an online class that I sell uh, to commercial people that want to learn how to use multispectral cameras and look at vegetation dynamics, et cetera. That's not what I'm going to talk about today. Um, so you may be trying to think about, like, how does an ecologist get into, um, into disaster mapping? Um, so a lot of that is just my location based here in California uh, and a, a relationship that I built with local law enforcement teams uh, working uh, in kind of the software world with photogrammetry and, and uh, just developing those relationships over time. And so it just started, actually just, I was the guy that they knew. And so when uh, emergencies arose, I was the, the person uh, that was local that they called. And that all started actually with the Ghost Ship fire. So Ghost Ship was a warehouse um, kind of art studio in Oakland, and there was a major fire there during a party uh, one evening when, when they were throwing kind of a... Um, a club type atmosphere, um, and a lot of uh, college kind of age kids didn't get out. Uh, there was about 30 fatalities in this major fire. And so they were interested in very quickly mapping the ghost ship uh, warehouse in 2D and in 3D before they went in and started ripping it uh, all apart. So I helped consult on that uh, particularly sad incident. And then that just kind of led to another phone call when uh, the major fires hit in California. So in October of 2017, um, this was basically immediately after forming Scholar Farms as a company, I was ready to start going to mapping vineyards. And then uh, all, you know, about 5,000 uh, residences in Santa Rosa went up overnight. Uh, and I talked a bit about this stuff before, um, but I was called in basically uh, under very sensitive situations. This was the first time that they were allowed to fly drones in a wildfire situation. So in California, they're very sensitive about uh, drones interrupting firefighting efforts from the air, particularly from manned aircraft, um, flying in and dropping uh, retardants and monitoring the fire, et cetera. So this was the first time that they really uh, allowed public safety teams to come in and fly drones. And I was asked to come in and help uh, with a site where there was, again, some, some fatalities from the fires coming in so quickly, and they wanted to map it before sending in uh, the, the uh, recovery teams, basically, before so they could document the area very quickly uh, and, and turn those data around to the agencies that were coordinating. And so this was a mobile home park that we, that we mapped very quickly, and then we moved on to mapping all of Coffee Park, which was a major neighborhood where thousands of homes went up. Um, and that was kind of my first experience in, in disaster mapping and capturing the data and trying to turn it around quickly. It was also during this time that I started experimenting uh, with other ways to document emergencies, including um, this photo that you see here. Uh, this is uh, one of the first 360 panoramas that I took um, saying, hey, we're mapping and that's great, this but this takes a while. What are other ways that we could just visualize very quickly? 
Um, and so we just use very off-the-shelf apps to um, get panoramas, what you typically do on vacation. I, I thought, well, it's, it's very interactive. Um, let's go ahead and try it on uh, this scene. And you can just see that it's very striking in terms of the information that you can collect. You can pan around. You can zoom in, similar to kind of Google Street View. So from there, uh, teams really deploy that method to, to go to different locations. So you can see a kind of a map off to the left. We can start adding pins and just kind of popping pins up to get a broader visualization of the scene. Um, and that really started uh, making me think about how do we do this faster? Like, sure, we have all these capabilities of drones, but what are the right tools? And, and do we need, you know, one-inch resolution mapping? And those are still, or can we get away with something like a panorama? Um, and those are still the questions that I ask uh, uh, today, is how do we make it quicker? How do we make it faster? How do we make it data cheaper? Uh, so that was the test fire. Um, I thought that I would be done with fires and emergencies. Um, it's not really my, my, uh, what I desire to do all the time. Um, but about nine months later or so, uh, the car fire hit. Um, and this was further north in Redding, so about three hours from the San Francisco Bay Area that I, uh, where I live. And this was um, uh, a couple, 150,000 acres or 180,000 acre fire. Uh, and it came down into Redding. Um, and there were about a, a thousand homes destroyed in the Redding area and then more broadly throughout the county. So just over a huge area, but did creep into uh, the city. And so again, teams were called in. I was asked if I wanted to, to come along to help on the data side. Um, and in this case, we did some mapping, but we started overlaying uh, the maps um, onto the satellite data. So here's a before and after that you can see. So there's a slider and you can see the before and after. We also overlaid the 360 panels on top of it, so we're starting to merge data layers together. Um, and then uh, we also experimented with some video. Um, that video ended up failing miserably because we shot it all at 4K, um, but it was a lesson learned uh, for the, the campfire, uh, which was to hit about uh, two and a half months later. We also did broader kind of 360 pins throughout the county. So here you can see all the, we did over 150 pins or, or so. Uh, of 360s for a broader visualization of areas that we just couldn't map. We can't map the whole thing. Uh, that's more for manned aircraft, but how can we, we visualize it uh, using these point locations? So that was a, a broader team effort. You can see me here as kind of the data nerdy person. Um, uh, that was about six different agencies in, involved in that particular fire. So that leads us uh, to basically the campfire. So in November of, this, uh, of 2018, the campfire hit. Uh, and basically destroyed the entire town of Paradise uh, almost overnight and then spread broadly into the county. So this is a town of about 25,000 people. It came in very quickly. Uh, there were lots of fatalities and lots of unaccounted people at the time that we were called in. And so uh, during this time, here's, a, here's a, uh, actually a map. Um, the, the fire started kind of up in this point here in the upper right-hand corner, and this, blue, this is a progression map. So, the blue area that you see, that's the first day of the fire. And Paradise is right here. Basically, that whole first day, it just swarmed in and basically took the whole town out and then spread broadly out throughout the county. Um, and that's what we're seeing in these fires in California, that it's really that first day, high winds, really dry conditions, and the fire just spreading incredibly quickly uh, and causing the most damage uh, before it can even uh, get under any kind of reasonable control or, or they can launch the infrastructure to start fighting it. Um, here's an aerial shot of, of the campfire. Um, and if you cut through the smoke, basically you can see all of paradise in the center here. This is that first day uh, just, just going up and, and smoke blowing. I mean, California had some of the worst air quality conditions uh, for weeks because of, of this fire. It was just, just horrendous. Uh, so this slide is, is to think about prep work. Uh, it's to remind me. So there's a lot of prep work that goes in uh, to thinking about being deployed out on, on these fires. And, and really, I just go in as the drone data coordinator. It's the public safety teams doing all the fl flying. Um, and so while before we're called in, I'm start. I basically now I, I go into this kind of cruise control of like, okay, what do I need to prepare? Um, what are the steps to really get ready to deploy into, into these kind of scenarios? 
Um, and that's things like going to Best Buy or, and loading up on SD cards and hard drives and updating all my software, my firmware, and making sure all my licenses are sorted, um, all sorts of prep work that goes into just kind of saying, okay, we're about to deal with a huge amount of data. Like, what do I need? Um, do I have enough external storage and batteries and all of this kind of stuff? The other thing that I do is try and look for intelligence coming out of the fire. So there's a lot of map data coming out from Cal Fire and, and uh, who manages these fires as well as the emergency services. And one of those maps is a structured damage assessment map. So these are teams actually going around by hand to, uh, to measure damage buildings. And it's usually just kind of points on a map. So here's one of the early structured damage assessment maps that I could find coming out of the fire. Um, and so what I did uh, before we were called in was start tracking this map. Where's the destruction? And I started exporting the data and doing uh, into Google Earth and taking measurements. How many acres is this? How many flights would that be? Uh, what would it be at uh, 100 meters versus 80 meters? Uh, what's the terrain like? I start just kind of diving into the geography of the area. I start looking at weather data. What's the weather conditions going to be? All the things that you need to think about to say, okay, we have teams entering, teams getting on the ground. What do we need to do? Um, so ultimately, I, I would print. I printed off a whole lot of maps. Uh, so I went to the copy store, and uh, this is tabloid size. If you're looking for the cheapest at FedEx, Kinkos, the cheapest nice. map you can print. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Oh, are you there, Patrick? Yes, I am. Um, oh, sorry. Just to Google, yeah. can you maybe perhaps put, um, speak a little further away from your mic? I think. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Is it, is it getting some, uh, you're getting some, uh, uh, some uh, feedback there? Yeah, I think that's a bit better. Thank you. Okay, yep. I can speak quieter, too. <laughs> uh, so, uh, here, here are basically some maps that I ended up printing off um, before we were deployed. Um, oops, let me go in here. Uh, before we were deployed out into the field, um, so we were called in basically to help with the search operations that were happening at the time. Um, and so I uh, basically I printed off these maps so that we would have hard copies along uh, with kind of soft copies and things that we, we had on our phones. Um, and so I just find it always easy to have kind of a, a hard copy in there as well. Okay, so um, we were asked to come in to support the law enforcement teams that were active in the search and recovery efforts. Uh, and this was about six to seven days after uh, the fire had come through. A lot of the active firefighting uh, had stopped in, in this particular um, in the main part of the town and was mostly in kind of broader efforts. Um, but one of the major challenges was that the smoke, you can see, just kind of really hung around um, during the week following. Um, and, and so that made it for much challenge, more challenging conditions than we had seen before, both in terms of visualization and also just it was a pretty unhealthy place to be. Um, the, one of the other challenges that we had was um, at first, we were limited to about 200 feet or so, so about 60, 70 meters. Um, and the problem with that is this was pretty hilly terrain, and we were limited to, to clear visual line of sight. And so as soon as the drones kind of took off and started flying um, over the trees, that angle made it very difficult to, to get any sort of large-scale maps. Uh, the following day, we were actually raised to about 300 feet or about 100 meters or so, um, 90 meters or so. Uh, and that made it much easier to kind of see the drones flying um, above the trees and maintain that visual line of sight. And that was the rules that we were uh, that we were allowed to come in in uh, is basically capped altitude and and maintaining sight of the drones. This also meant that we couldn't use fixed wings um, because we couldn't cover that big of an area at any given time. And also with just kind of the terrain and and the disaster situation and just kind of very sketchy neighborhoods, um, this all. We were just limited to kind of off-the-shelf uh, of copters, so so we standardized on just kind of Phantom Fours um, and uh, with a 20 megapixel camera if we could, um, and then kind of standardize our apps and our, and our procedures there. A couple of days later, actually, the smoke kind of blew out. The winds picked up just a little bit enough to blow out the smoke, and that made things a lot a lot easier. But those first few days, we're really just trying to figure out how to how to deal with this whole situation. Okay, so 
as I said, we were brought in under law enforcement teams. We were asked to, uh, to, to help in the search effort or the uh, uh, kind of the recovery effort. Um, and our first step was actually to divide the town up. They just wanted this area west of a, a street called Clark, which was one of the main streets kind of going down the center, all of it kind of west of that. And so that was about fairly tangible. Um, but we quickly ran into um, a, a range of problems. Um, the first problem was that uh, um, I was trying to rapidly stitch all the data using PIX4D fields. And if you haven't tried PIX4D fields with RGB data, it's an offline uh, or a desktop software that you can um, basically stitch incredibly rapidly. So in five to ten minutes, you can have a two-dimensional orthomosaic. Um, and it's mostly geared towards farming at the moment, um, but it does like beautiful rapid response uh, data, and it is offline, so you don't need that internet connection. You can also get away with slightly lower overlap. You don't need that kind of 75% or 80% or yes. And so I thought, okay, we can go in here and we can just rapidly process these big areas, and we can have it even, you know, the same day start delivering results. Um, and so we ended up dividing the teams up into different zones based on kind of that structure damage assessment and then just using Google Maps to kind of divide up the areas so that teams didn't overlap too much and, uh, and that, you know, we were coordinating kind of the safety of all the flights. But the first thing uh, w that I found is, is we ran into some problems um, with the imagery. And so I was out in the field kind of spot checking this. There was about five teams or so flying that uh, first day or two. Um, and I started having gaps in the PIX4D field maps. And that was for two reasons. One, I was flying at 50 or 60% overlap, and it was just too low uh, of, of an overlap for uh, – and the second reason was that smoky conditions. That smoke just really – impacted the, the mission planning, uh, or sorry, impacted the, the image stitching um, and the image processing. So it just really kind of dilutes the features that the images can be used for, uh, 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 for mapping. And so that was a problem. So we had to up our overlap. And also the second problem was that the search and recovery teams wanted higher resolution. So uh, pix 40 Fields provides pretty good resolution, but they were actually used to that kind of um, – uh, super high resolution that you would see if you process fully. So that kind of one, uh, two centimeter resolution or so. And that's what they ended up wanting. Um, so this made it uh, where we had to process all the imagery fully. And that was of a time period. So what I thought was like super rapid and quick, um, I quickly had to kind of abandon those methods and go for full processing. Um, and so that's basically I started to figure out, okay, what are we going to do here? How are we going to process all this data together? Uh, it's a huge area. Uh, so that meant upping the overlap. So up to 75%, 70% uh, is ultimately what we did in that kind of uh, front and side lap. And that meant each team could cover just a much smaller area uh, uh, than, say, 50 or 60% overlap, which I was trying to get away with. So I, I was trying to go quick and, and fast, and it, ultimately that was kind of a mistake. Um, but it was a lesson learned in, in saying, okay, well, you got to do it. If we did it right the first time, uh, we wouldn't have to go back and remap some of these areas. But, but uh, with such a large area and such a demand, fast, that was just what we ultimately ended up doing. The other problem was that they updated the structure map. Um, and so this was a time where, again, they, they were actively going through and assessing damage. Um, I'll also say it was a time when, because of that smoke and the visibility, they couldn't bring in manned aircraft. So one of the common questions is, why don't you just bring in a helicopter or a plane? Uh, visibility made it so that drones were really the only tools that we could use. But if you look from the previous map to kind of this updated map, I thought that, okay, here's 2,000 acres and here's the rest of the town. But if you look at the rest of the town, like, it's basically everything's gone. Um, and so they updated that map a couple days into it. And I looked at the new map, and I kind of just, uh, I had that sinking gut kind of feeling of like, oh, crap, like, what are we going to do now? Um, and they also wanted the entire town. They said, okay, uh, we, you know, that's great what you're proposing.
acres, you're up to you know five, six, seven thousand acres or so. It's just like a huge uh, area to cover for for all the damage. So that was a daunting task. The other problem that we faced was um, uh, the president came into town, and so that shut down all the airspace uh, for an entire day. Um, so they just landed everything, and, and we weren't able to fly. But the, that actually led to an opportunity. Um, where we had some breathing room to really figure out, like, okay, how are we going to do this? Um, and, and so basically our newest task wasn't Paradise West of Clark. It was all a paradise. We were still limited to that 300 feet. They wanted full resolution and overlap. Uh, and so the following day we had about 15 to 16 drone teams coming in from uh, seven to eight uh, both law enforcement and fire agencies. And then we only had two days to finish it. So Thanksgiving was approaching. The rains were also coming. Um, everyone was going to be gone on holiday. Um, so we had a very limited uh, uh, window. To, and they were, you know, it was pressing demands for, for the data uh, to get the data and get it to the teams that were coordinating everything. So all of that led to kind of a high pressure uh, uh, situation. So here's what we ultimately did. We, we took a step back and said, OK, um, with all of these teams coming in, let's pre-plan all the missions. And so we. Uh, we sat down um, and coordinated uh, a design within drone deploy so that we could pre-plan all the flight plans in all the zones so that when people showed up, they had their zone and then they can just go. So within drone deploy, you can, we created folders and in those folders, uh, we had kind of different sections of paradise and Megalia, which is, is close to paradise. Um, and it, within each of these then, we had zones of about 300 acres or so. So we thought, well, okay, every team has about four to five batteries before they have to recharge uh, per drone. Let's divide up the zones into sections that they could then fly and go out for a couple hours. And then when they finish the zone, we'll just assign them a new one. So pre-planning all the missions and then sharing them made it super easy uh, to just coordinate that within the teams. So when the teams arrived then, um, Ultimately, we had probably around 40 people or so from different agencies. Uh, Romeo from Drone Deploy was also, or Romeo from DJI was also there. He was um, pretty uh, super helpful in terms of just thinking about the data and, and helping with the mission planning. He did a lot of the heavy lifting when it came to designing all those zones. Um, and we had two people. We had kind of a drone safety kind of air boss, and then we had me as kind of the data person. And we worked side by side kind of coordinating. Uh, so we had law enforcement and public safety teams organizing themselves, and then me kind of organizing the data side of, of okay, after the drones land, what do we do next? Um, so as teams were assigned their, their zones, they would go out into the field, and then they would come back in. Um, and we had a very simple green sticker, red sticker, Ziploc bag method. Um, so you handed in your SD card, uh, you put it in a, a Ziploc bag, you labeled it with your zone, and it had a red sticker if it wasn't backed up to a hard drive and a green sticker. Uh, and here we're just working out of the back of a truck. We didn't have kind of a fancy mobile command center um, like some of this, the agencies did. Um, uh, we're just kind of figuring it out as, as we go along. So I can highly recommend the green sticker, red sticker. Uh, method. So it turns you once you back up all the data, you stick a green sticker on there, and then you know that um, that SD card is good and that zone is cleared, and you kind of set up this this triage of data coming in, uh, so that you're always de double checking your zone to your data to your folders uh, to teams, and you can then kind of seamlessly ha have that process as uh, as uh, working as you're coordinating the teams. So there's my Ziploc bag method. I like it's. Learn and, and, and really helpful thing on this particular fire was I had a, a volunteer kind of data person working alongside me um, that was taking all the SD cards and the zones and backing them up into folders, labeling the folders appropriately, and then putting those on hard drives. And so I didn't have to do that whole process, and it saved about half of my stress on this event to have someone there just tracking and triaging all the data and making sure it gets in the right place and that we're checking off all the zones um, as we're mapping. And so having kind of the data support side and infrastructure there um, was super important and was made it uh, much less stressful. So I highly recommend having someone uh, that just doesn't talk to anyone. They just focus the whole time on how to get the photos off the drones into the folders, labeled appropriately, and then boot batch for processing. 
So all the, we, we ended up setting up a sneaker net. Um, so instead of actually batch uploading, you know, about tens of thousands of photos at a time, uh, we contacted Drone Deploy down in San Francisco, uh, and we just had runners driving hard drives down to very quick internet down in San Francisco, and we and Drone Deploy assisted in uploading all of the imagery directly to their servers to process. So the first day uh, we collected, we captured about uh, 30,000 photos or so. Then that was driven overnight. Drone deploy stayed up all night uploading all of those photos. Um, and then by the morning we could see the imagery, imagery processing. Um, so each ad could log into drone deploy and see each of the maps as they finished. So zone 41A, um, was done and I could just see and track the whole progress. And so that made me feel really good um, to just see those those different sections of map popping up. So after um, about 24 hours, all the maps from the previous day were, were finished. Uh, so that way we could just see it uh, processing very quickly and, and putting all the layers or having all the layers popped up. The other thing that we were able to do is with each section of map, we could overlay them uh, as a KML onto a bigger map, and we could look for gaps in our mission planning. So then once our zones were done, we started planning in gaps. So these are missions that would fill in so that the map would be fairly seamless. Uh, those are areas that were kind of just small little single flight sections of map um, that we could uh, target so that our map would be clean and cover the area that we want. It's hard when you're piecing it all together uh, to really see the big picture, and we weren't we were trying to cut out areas of trees and parks and things that weren't part of that uh, damage assessment. So having that gap planning was actually pretty crucial to having good quality results at the end. So kind of the stats here, we had about 500 flights, 70,000 photos, about 477 gigs of data, um, a trillion or so map pixels, and ultimately we covered about 70, 17,000 acres or about 26 square miles. Now that's not a full 17,000 acres. There were certain sections of map that overlapped with one another or had to be redone um, because of that first day, um, but ultimately we mapped a huge area. Um, we also overlaid about 175 panoramas on top of that for point locations, um, and then we did um, uh, some video, which I'll talk about in just a bit. So that was really the first part of the challenge was capturing all the data, putting it, uploading it to the cloud, processing it, seeing it. So now what? We have, you know, four dozen sections of maps. How do we piece all of that information uh, together? Ultimately, that came down to Drone Deploy was able to, to pull that together themselves. They were able to merge it within their servers uh, and visualize it online. I, basically, it was either that or we had to download each section re-upload it into ArcGIS and tile it um, and, and then release that publicly. And that was going to take at least another week of work. Uh, and this was the day or so before Thanksgiving. Drone Deploy was able to merge everything together and create this map um, that you see here. And then we were able to uh, basically embed that map into the county website and then we released it uh, the, the following day. So just to kind of summarize, we captured all the data on like a Sunday and a Monday. Uh, we processed it all, and then we turned it around for by um, the Tuesday or so into a complete map, and it was released that following Wednesday by the county, uh, or Thursday, Wednesday, Thursday or so, uh, right before Thanksgiving. Um, so it was just incredibly fast turnaround um, for uh, uh, such a huge endeavor and a huge amount of data, uh, and, and really it was a team effort uh, by all. So here are the data layers. We had that swipe map where you could swipe back and forth and see the damage. We overlaid all of the property boundaries so you could click on a property and you could see every single address. Um, and that's really useful uh, because it's, it's sometimes difficult to see is, is that my property, is that the neighbors or if relatives are looking at it. So having those property boundaries overlaid is something uh, they really like. We also did video. And so I'll talk just briefly about this. Um, this was an experiment that I ran with uh, three teams of law enforcement. Each team was a driver and somebody flying. Um, and basically we said, okay, let's, if we had to map all the in infrastructure just with video, um, how much could we get done in about an hour? So we had about an hour at the end of the day. Um, and uh, so we had sent these three teams out with just Phantoms and Mavics. And actually they were able to video map 
every major street within Paradise in about 60 minutes or so. And, and then we took that video and the flight logs from the drones, and you can overlay that on a map. So here you can see um, basically one of the sections of the map. Um, so you can press play and you can see the drone flying, um, but you can also see all of the videos side by side. And so this really was a realization of, look, uh, you know, if you just need critical infrastructure, the video could do it incredibly quickly. Uh, let's start with that and then start talking about, uh, talking about map layers. And those videos are actually on the, uh, the broader drone deploy map as well as those little orange dots. Um, so on this map, you can zoom in, you can see every house, you can see all the panos in blue, and then you can see the video overlaid. So we try to merge those data layers together in kind of an interactive uh, map. So ultimately, this was a huge effort by a lot of people. You can see me again in flannel. Uh, and, and it was just kind of an amazing team to be a part of, and, and I'm really uh, thankful to, to help out on the data side. Um, and ultimately, the data went to the search team. So this is a, one of the maps of, of just them clearing individual properties one at a time. Um, and, and it really helped in um, uh, that whole process of just having really high resolution imagery they could look at to help coordinate that effort. The other thing that happened is the rains were coming in at that time, uh, and they used some of the data to start planning for flooding control and mudslides and where to kind of target for erosion control. Um, also, the data were shared with the Environmental Protection Agency for thinking about the cleanup side of things. So lots of agencies started to kind of use the data as it uh, was released, but ultimately it was the public uh, releasing it all publicly uh, so quickly that, that I think had the biggest impact so that people, you know, you had tens of thousands of people evacuated from their homes uh, thinking about, you know, what does their property look like, what's their lives going to be like, uh, and, and you're able to look at that at very high resolution. So just briefly, I want to talk about the road ahead and kind of the obstacles that we uh, face moving forward. Here's a big mountain to show kind of we've got a long way to go when it comes to uh, these data layers. Um, so here's just still, still some major issues that I see with, with uh, kind of public safety and emergency response and, and drones. Um, first, it's, it's really still about the drone. Uh, everybody's still focused on the hardware, uh, the different sensors, thermal imagery, and a lot of that is for kind of search and rescue and that live feed. That's not really what I deal with. Um, it's, I really deal with just kind of how do you put those geospatial data layers together and visualize that. And that's not about the hardware at all. It's all about the data. Next, there's no standard um, kind of protocol for data capture. So um, every fire, we've done the data capture differently with different apps, different ways to process, some in the cloud, some on desktop locally. Um, there needs to be a standardization both within teams and among teams for how you do this and, and how you create that workflow. We're getting closer to it, um, but we're still not there yet in terms of standardizing training and certifying people to kind of come in and do it very quickly and, and smoothly. Uh, another challenge is that the industry changes so fast and startups fail. So one software I might use this time, are they going to be around a year from now, um, or uh, is, is that tool going to be available? So um, who I use now might not be who I use later. That's, that can be a challenge. Uh, another major challenge is that the end of the funnel really isn't clear. And by that, I mean who owns the data and, and who do I deliver these to? And that also changes uh, for every fire. Um, and so there needs to be kind of a standard protocol of, okay, the, the drone teams are really just kind of the boots on the ground, but this whole funnel has to go someplace and someone has to own that whole process. Um, it, it can't change with every emergency. And then... The end result is all of these data layers and making it public isn't clear. So, um, you know, how do we make it public? In what format? What do we tell people? How do we know, let them know that the process is coming? How do we know, let them know how to interpret this imagery? Um, all of that is kind of uh, just a hodgepodge now of, of, of communication. Um, so I'll just put this together into what I see uh, for future disasters within the state. Um, really, I see dividing the operations up into two factors. One is safety, so someone managing all the airspace and the safety and the drone teams and the flights. So in the U.S., that's the FAA who controls the airspace. CAL FIRE has manned aircraft. Those teams would coordinate with an air boss, so a, a drone air boss that's coordinating all the drone teams for flight and safety. On the other half, though, is the data side, and that's all the managing agencies and stakeholders 
they're coordinating with a drone data boss and their team, so a central brain for all the data. And they're then working with the air boss on the safety side to coordinate the drone team. So you have two separate teams working together, one safety, flight, airspace, two data, processing, delivery, and, and the drone teams are just kind of a, a, a part of that whole process. So um, ultimately, if you don't have that process and infrastructure set up, then I think you're going to be winging it every single time. Um, one thing I've tried to do is, is put together um, a, an online course that basically teaches people how to be data, drone data analysts. And you can check out that course at scholarfarms.com slash R2D2, so it's rapid response drone data, uh, unofficially R2D2. I'm sure that's totally, um, uh, that's not an official uh, copyrighted, I mean, that's copyrighted, but, uh, and it's, it's a $400 course that uh, you can get an early bird 100 is, is the coupon you can use to check out. Um, we also have uh, some sponsorships and scholarships for the course that I'll share with Patrick. Um, and you can basically walk through all the process and the theory behind mapping, the different data layers, debriefs, um, a lot of different aspects of how to do all of the things that I've learned and all the mistakes I've made kind of along the way. So you can go uh, check out that course um, and sign up and take the course. It's a whole about 100 lecture video series or so. Uh, and again, 100 bucks off. It's I barely launched. This is kind of the announcement of the soft launch. It'll hard launch uh, later this week and, and next week. Um, but uh, you get a discounted um, uh, access to the course uh, for, for the next uh, uh, two weeks or so. Um, and, and then the price will go up to kind of the full commercial pricing. Um, I think that's about all I have, Patrick. I know I kind of rambled along. Uh, let me just kind of finish with saying, um, if you, these emergencies and these disasters really require a well-coordinated funnel. So from the drone pilots to the data analysts to the coordinating agencies, so capturing and processing and visualizing and informing. If you don't have that funnel established, uh, then you're into a lot of pain points uh, and reinventing the wheel every time you go into one of these situations. So the next challenge is really building in that infrastructure at a local level, a state level, a federal level uh, for dealing with drone data in these kind of disasters. And so uh, that's what I'd brought, really like to see moving forward is, is developing that infrastructure out and uh, standardizing it and making it kind of lean and mean. Perfect. Thank you very, very much, Greg. Really, really appreciate all these insights. Um, the fact that they're just also very much first-hand learnings in terms of what worked and, and what still needs to be improved is, is helpful to all of us who are involved in, in this space. So we've got a number of questions from Andrew and Brian that I'm going to quickly uh, maybe read one off uh, uh, at a time. For sure. others who would like to chime in, please use the chat uh, function. That'll probably be the, uh, the most efficient. So. Uh, quickly, Andrew from, um, from MIT was asking, you know, what, why, why not use fixed wings within visual line of sight uh, to kind of speed things up? Yeah, I, the, the challenge in working in this kind of terrain, and I don't know, Patrick, can you see this, uh, can you see these data layers here? Yes, thank uh, you. That I'm showing. So it's a fairly hilly terrain, and so um, fly over a huge area. So finding takeoff and landing spots for a fixed wing for an EB or something like that uh, was a challenge because of the, of the big area. We're fairly new to this area. We would have to find takeoff and landing spots. And um, uh, one of the challenges is just kind of a logistical one. These teams, um, they know how to use phantoms and, and have those as standard data uh, uh, capturing devices. So using what they know and what they understand is, is probably the easiest thing to start with. And then two, uh, visual line of sight was just different for different locations uh, with, with kind of hilly terrain. And so uh, they wanted to ensure that they didn't lose vehicles, that they were operating incredibly safely. Uh, and, and so it just wasn't logistically possible. They, they would disappear too quickly into the smoke or over trees uh, in, you know, and, and that varied with location across Paradise. And so ideally, you would have brought in fixed wings and EVs and mapped 500 acres at a time, um, but that just wasn't possible. Ideally, you'd bring in a manned aircraft. And they did, about two weeks later, uh, bring in manned aircraft under FEMA and, and mapped it all. Gotcha. Thanks very much, uh, Greg. Um, Question from Brian, are you or the first responders, uh, SAR teams using mobile PPS like collector for ArcGIS to get near real-time damage assessments or aid requests on the ground 
in order to co co uh, correlate that with that data from the air? Uh, the SAR teams were using, I'm not sure what, uh, they did have iPads with them that they were collecting all the data as they did all the checks uh, for the house, uh, for the houses. I, uh, basically, merging the data layers happened kind of later after we could get standardized kind of geotiffs that could be imported into uh, Esri. So you can see here, like, this is an Esri storyboard map that you see. We can zoom in, um, and it's, and it's all of the data, and you have the property boundaries. So they, once you import it into Esri, they can add in all those data layers and merge all the data layers together. Now, each agency is basically, uh, what I've found is that each agency kind of operates in a silo when it comes to, um, uh, to data. So EPA is collecting their own data on kind of uh, where kind of the toxic areas that they need to clean up. FEMA uh, might be collecting their own data in terms of emergency response. The insurance companies are collecting their own data. So there's no real central hub to overlay and manage all these data layers like you, like you would want. Uh, it's kind of agencies operating independently and me trying to kind of weave in between all of them as kind of an independent person, uh, not belonging to any agency, and try and bring those layers together and have those conversations. Uh, and that can lead to a lot of challenges. Thanks, Greg. And I mean, it's, it's, I mean we're seeing the same thing in international uh, humanitarian disaster response uh, efforts in terms of the silos. And I think one advantage, the obvious, the obvious fact that you're, your experience, you've got the data skills and so on, is, is that you are independent and you can weave between these. It doesn't make it easy that <laughs> your job is not easy. But because you don't have that uh, logo of, uh, you know, a big uh, disaster response organization in your shirt and you're more independent, that, that's, that's, that's not to be under, um, underestimated in terms of being able to, to collaborate with these different groups. That's, that's great to hear. A couple other follow-up questions from Brian and Andrew, and I'll, and I'll read off both at the same time. The, the first from Brian is whether uh, the teams had um, – all of the flights uh, basically uh, preset, pre-programmed in their software uh, before each flight, or did they actually have to input them individually before each flight? And then Andrew asked, uh, you know, where where was CAP? Were they were always also deployed? So how did they how did they all fit in uh, with the the air, the, the unmanned uh, response? Yeah. So so uh, ultimately, we programmed all the missions in drone deploy as kind of pre-programmed missions of 300 acres at a time. The teams would then take that original section. Um, you could launch that mission and just let the drone fly and map and switch out batteries, but the visual line of sight issue became an, uh, came into play. Um, and so basically what people would do is themselves divide up that bigger mission into smaller sections uh, that they could maintain visual line of sight uh, from a given uh, launching point where they were deployed at. And we, and each team had um, spotters as well as pilots uh, as part of as part of that. So even though we designed a bigger section and shared that with them and they had that, they had to carve it up into smaller sections depending on kind of what the environment and the ecosystem looked like. Um, Civil Air Patrol came in um, and mapped uh, about a week and a half later after the rain, and then I think they turned that around uh, within about 72 hours or so after that. So they mapped for about two days with manned aircraft. Um, those data layers went to FEMA, and FEMA kind of coordinated those data layers coming out. These initial data layers uh, went to the local county, which kind of owned it all. Um, but again, there was no real merging of kind of drone data and manned aircraft data. And in fact, the manned aircraft data was, looked really good, um, and, it, and it came back to uh, what we could do in the visible and the smoke conditions and, and the uh, and manned aircraft couldn't come in because of uh, a lot of still the air attack going on on, on the fire. So it's, it's kind of timing of like what, when do you bring in drones and when do you bring in manned aircraft, how do you, you know, who gets the data and what, uh, that, that still needs kind of sorted out. Thanks, Greg. And actually just on that note, Andrew just followed up and said that uh, Family Cap also deployed deployed drones. Were you in touch with those drone teams or not? Uh, I I was not. I think that again that was after um, this initial okay. deployment. Um, okay. uh, I will say that like I I'm pretty when it comes to the organization and the deployments of coming in like I'm the data guy and I think mostly about the data layers and how to get them mm -hmm. to the right place and less so uh, like the uh, the bigger agency coordination which I lead to puts the law enforcement and public safety teams sit in on those meetings. 
All righty. Um, we've got about five or so minutes left and, and a, a couple other really good questions. Um, Brian followed up with asking whether you used uh, strictly sort of multi-rotors or if you are at some point uh, will consider fixed wings uh, to get more coverage also. And I know you've already answered that, qu to mm -hmm. that question, but maybe in terms of future, if, if you think that's, that's something that might uh, be considered. But uh, more, more to the point now on a slightly different question, whether you used um, a FLIR for, for hotspots or LIDAR um, or, or even 3D imagery, uh, if any of those other types of sensors or products uh, are potentially useful. Yeah, I think I think they're, uh, the the thermal cameras uh, it, were being used. Um, so they they had uh, military aircraft at night. So all the manned aircraft land uh, at at night you know, that are fighting the fires. And so they bring in I think it's a Reaper or some kind of military aircraft mm -hmm. from the Air National Guard. And that over the evening time uh, the nighttime tracks the fire perimeter using um, fairly high, you know, value thermal cameras that can track uh, location. And so they're using that. I think more and more they're, they're interested in using smaller, lower cost drones with thermal cameras for looking for hot spots. And, um, but they're still super conservative uh, for bringing drones into these, um, into these fires. So in the aftermath, it's really, you know, day two or three, you're not going to bring in the drone teams. This is really about damage assessment and kind of the recovery side and less so the active fighting. Um, which is still, you know, they're just sensitive to it. It's going to take a lot of kind of preliminary trials to figure out how to how to do it safely. Uh, on a 3D, you know, I think people really like the 3D side. It's good for kind of structural damage assessment. Um, but it, one of the questions to ask and that I continue to ask is like, what's the point here of all of this data? Like, there's what you can do with drones. And also, it's like, well, if you can get by with video, just use video. If that just gives you a situational awareness, like, just do that. Um, so having kind of all the tools at hand, it's really like, what's the quickest and dirtiest tool I can get away with is, is my, you know, right. my opinion. Gotcha. Thanks so much, Greg. So I've got a few last questions. I'll just quickly summarize them all here. Uh, Lee's asking, you know, whether... Um, whether there were any 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 incidents or uh, lost aircraft uh, crashes and so on, um, Rishav is asking about you know uh, a, a sort of a repository where we can all work together on on standard operating procedures um, for rapid uh, response teams. Um, Tom is asking uh, also like this question is asking whether drone deploy. Um, if, if they have, didn't happen to be within driving distance, uh, you know, would you still recommend going with with, uh, with drone deploy? Um, I know there's a lot of questions, but I'm trying to get them all in now. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then the last one is, let's see, uh, how real is the requirement for generating real-time or near real-time data? So how, you know, was it really that time sensitive? Um, and uh, maybe what, also what, some, what the major pain points were. So um, I can... <laughs> There's kind of a lot in there. Yeah, um, I'm not aware of any incidents. Like, it was incredibly safe kind of operations. I think there were probably some broken props as a drone landed on a, you know, on an uneven slope or something like that and tipped over kind of those normal kind of pain points. But no, it was amazing kind of the coordination there. Um, in terms of... Um, the data side, I mean, I think that they wanted data as soon as possible, uh, and, and there's, you know, this is a, a disaster situation. Um, what that means is, uh, is really up to the agencies involved. It's kind of different for each agency. If it's real time or, or day of versus three days later versus a week later, it's just kind of really up to uh, what the different applications um, are. Um, and so, you know, I think those are all good questions in terms of, of what do you really need, um, and then in terms of centralizing it and standardizing it, I mean that's a that's a that's a question for Patrick in terms of uh, of you know I'm willing I will say that I'm kind of um, along for the ride here when it comes to disasters and emergencies like they don't uh, I don't get paid for this stuff and and it's actually fairly difficult to get in on the payroll and contracts with these agencies. Um, for me, it's super stressful 
um, to do all of this and, and super sad. Um, but I think in terms of standardizing it, I mean, Patrick, what's your thoughts? Like, are you guys coming up with a with a whole standardization for how you do all this stuff? Uh, yeah, I mean, this is actually a question from Rishabh, who is with uh, India Flying Labs, part of the Flying Labs uh, network that uh, recently recently launched in in India, and um, they've already had a, 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 a workshop looking at this. And uh, Rishabh, what, what we can do is continue working with you and team there. Uh, there's already some resources available on on UAVators.org, the, the humanitarian UAV uh, network, and we will be updating our humanitarian drone course. Um, in coming months as well, where where we can consolidate more of that information and, and develop that kind of rep or not develop, refine, update that kind of repository. Um, last uh, question. Uh, I think the question on drone deploy was a good one. Um, in terms of would I still use drone deploy? I think you know obviously if something you know if we we're in Haiti or in super rural areas where where we couldn't access the internet. Um, stuff like even just this video that I'm showing here, like that's still about 16 gigs of video. Um, I think there's some stuff that you have to be prepared to do offline, and I would use Pix4D or Drone to Map by Esri or something for offline processing. But in this case, I would have needed like 20, you know, high uh, output or, or high end gaming computers at a time to process mm -hmm. all that imagery and turn it around. So I think mm -hmm. there's times where you do it offline, there's times where you, if you can upload the data, do it. If you can fly a hard drive to, you know, Dubai or Singapore or something and actually do it a day later, do that, you know. So I think it's really kind of up to what the capabilities are, and that varies with every situation. I mean, even having, we had emergency um, uh, cell coverage. They would drove in some uh, some vans and stuff. So even just having that for base maps was super useful in, in this particular situation and a luxury that you don't have elsewhere. Gotcha. Thank you. I mean, just from also from personal experience, we tried to do that after Cyclone Pam, which is a Category 5 cyclone in, in Vanuatu back in 2015, uh, because uh, the internet connection was um, uh, not, uh, not optimal, let's put it that way. Uh, so what we wanted to do was have somebody fly back to New Zealand uh, and upload the data, but the, the government of Vanuatu was against that. They did not want the data actually <laughs> physically leaving, if you'd like, uh, the country, uh, even though, you know, later on they, they made it available online, wanted to create a comment and so on. But there's also that element that we found in, in international yeah. efforts. I That's think that is, that was four years ago now, and I think that the, the field has changed. But um, Well, but it, I mean, it's going to be country specific. Even I was just in Sweden, they have much stricter privacy rules. Uh, mm -hmm. than in the U.S. And in this case, we make it public because that's what the incident command wants, you know, and they right. give the, they own all the data. And so, I, you know, for uh, it's going to be variable depending on the sensitivity of, of the scenario. Very good. Well, thank you so much, Greg. Thank you. Yeah, for your time. of course. Very yeah, and I think we'll coordinate. So I think there are some scholarships available for the course. Um, I think they can reach out. We'll figure out how to reach out to, to you guys. Uh, and vet those uh, for international folks that can't afford to to take uh, the the course and and um, otherwise you can go to uh, scholarfarms.com slash r2d2 or just my website uh, and use that early bird 100 to, to discount uh, the course and and uh, I poured in everything that I know into that course and hoping to to help other people learn uh, to do what I do. Thank you very much, Greg, and I, to everybody who's joined. Thank you so much for your time. I highly endorse uh, the, the, the training, the course, uh, the online training that that uh, Greg has been putting a lot of time and effort in putting together. You're going to, you, you basically got a, uh, a, a, a sort of a trailer version um, highlight of, of some of the nuggets. There's so much more. Having looked it through an initial version of that course, there there's some real gems in there uh, uh, for standard operating procedures, tactics, strategies to enable the rapid collection uh, an analysis of this data. So, so please consider that. And, and for our flying labs who are, I see a Kenya flying or uh, India flying labs, Tanzania flying labs, Dominican Republic flying labs also joining, uh, we will make that course also available to you uh, so that you can uh, uh, develop your skills further. Thank you, everyone. Again, Greg, you're a champ. Continue yeah, the good thanks, work. Man. Uh, let us know how we can help. All right. Sounds good. All right. Take care, everyone. Thank you.